Welcome again to the second of our seasonal messages entitled Blessings from the Boat. We're turning in the Word of God to Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, and we're reading from the verse 26, a very special portion of Scripture, so which will be used much in these days. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, and verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail thou, that art highly favoured. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind, what manner of salutation could this be? And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And, th and therefore, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That's an unfortunate translation there, the holy thing. It's not a proper language to try and describe our Lord as a thing. Verse uh, 42 of the same chapter. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women. You'll have noticed that that's twice that has been said in this reading. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a formance of those things which were told or from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Saviour. We broke into something that Elizabeth said there as well. And we know that the Lord will bless to us the public reading of his own precious, infallible, and indestructible word. Over 30 years ago, at a funeral service in an open graveyard, round an open grave. We were burying an old aged mother. And I'll never forgot what, forget what the preacher prayed around the grave that day. He said, Oh God, if Ireland needs anything, Ireland needs godly mothers. I say if that was true then, it is certainly true now. While the, while the father is the head of the home, the mother surely is the heart of the home. After reflecting upon that statement, I took down a concordance and I tried to count all the women, godly and ungodly, that we find in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I stopped counting at about 250. 
having studied many of them and preached on a number of them, if I were asked who my favorite woman or mother in the Bible was, I would have to say about Mary, whom we have been reading about the mother of Christ, the one who gave birth to the incarnate Son of God. She carried him for nine months. She loved him. She held him. She fed him. She clothed him. She protected him. And for 33 and a half years, she watched him and was most of the time, or a lot of the time, by her side, by his side, until that faithful, until that fateful day when she stood around the cross. And as the prophecy said, a, soul, a sword pierced right into her soul. As she stood brokenhearted and watched him stripped and dying on that old wooden cross at Calvary, we don't end seeing her there. We see her later on after that in prayer. The first advent of Christ, our Savior, which we're about to celebrate now very shortly, is comprised of and uh, in inextricably linked with three godly women. There were a small remnant in these days, there were evil days, there were dark days, days of Herod, the wicked king, days when Rome was in control and occupied the Jewish nation and had bludgeoned them into submission. There were days of viciousness, vile, uh, viciousness and violence. There were days of immorality and infidelity. There were days of murder and days of destruction, something like the days in which we are living in right now. But God had three godly women in those days, and he has three godly and 3,000 godly and far more women, thank God, in these days, who stand amongst the wickedness that goes on around it. God always has his mothers who love their children and who love the Lord himself. Women in these days uh, are many of them godly and so faithful that they stand against all this woke ideology, all this abortion and transgenderism, and all this evil and nonsense that they're pre speaking to the children. Thank God there's mothers who guard and love and protect their children from such things. These were three ordinary, everyday, unassuming women. First one was Elizabeth, the second one was Mary, whom we're reading about, and the third one was Anna. Before we highlight a couple of facts about the Blessed Virgin Mary, and remember that's what the Scripture calls her, she was the Blessed Virgin Mary. Before we speak something of her this evening or this day, let us look for a moment at Elizabeth, who bore John the Baptist. You know the story of Elizabeth, how her and her husband, Zechariah, prayed for years and years that God would give them a son. It was very imperative and very important that a Jewish woman should bear a son. And once she went past the childbearing age, she, it seems that they maybe gave up praying. And uh, she was old and she was stricken in years. And then one day, one powerful day, after 400 years of silence, heaven opened, heaven opened. And the angel Gabriel appeared uh, to Zacharias in, Zacharias in the temple. And he said to him, thy prayer is heard. Elizabeth shall conceive and bear a son. Could I say to you that her praying mothers praying for your sons, praying for your daughters. Maybe they're wayward and out in the mountains, as we say, wild and bare, but keep on praying because God doesn't forget. And our God, my God, he's good at answering prayer. And once uh, John the Baptist was conceived in her womb, the Bible says she hid herself for five months. 
to be alone with God. There was no swaggering about. There was no pride. Away she got and got alone with God. And here's what Elizabeth said. Thank you, Lord, for answering my prayer and taking away my reproach and my shame and lifting my burden. I want to say to you, Elizabeth was a thankful mother. A thankful mother. Are you a thankful mother? Are you not thankful tonight that the Lord has looked upon you? Are you not thankful tonight that the Lord has saved you and answered your prayers time and time again? He has called you. He has saved you. He has lifted burdens from you. He has taken like her away your reproach and away your shame. Oh, I say, how we need to thank the Lord for all that he has done in his life. And remember this prayers that you have long forgotten. God is well able and God is well capable of answering them. We need to be thankful tonight. You need to be thankful for your children. You need to be thankful for your health. You need to be thankful for your husband or your wife. You need to be thankful for the blessings that the Lord has bestowed upon you today. Be thankful that you haven't cancer. Be thankful that you, have, that you haven't a coronary. Be thankful tonight that you haven't Parkinson's. Be thankful tonight if you have health and strength. Give thanks unto the Lord. For the scripture says, we're to enter his gates with thanksgiving and with praise. Oh, count their blessings, the hymn says, and name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And mind you, if you have any of those things that I'm after speaking or mentioning or maybe a hundred things more, remember this, you can still praise him and thank him for he's a God who loves you and a God who knows all about you. Elizabeth was very thankful. Then when you come to Anna, Anna was very faithful. It says in the next chapter that night and day she departed not from the house of God. Oh, listen, whoever you are and listening to me just now, remember this, if you're a Christian and you're saved by the grace of God, you should be in the house of God on the Lord's day. The Bible tells us very clearly that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as some, as a manner of some is, as we see this last dark days approaching. Get into fellowship and get into the house of God. This woman was in the house of God. It says she prayed and she fasted and she waited until Jesus came, until he came into the temple with his mother and father. My dear friend, when she saw him, oh, how delighted she was that she had waited on him. Now, you know, we're waiting on the second coming of the Lord. We're waiting on him to burst through the clouds any of these days. May he find us faithful, waiting and watching and praying and praising, for soon he'll burst the clouds and come again and take us home to be with himself. Oh, I say, it's good. It's good to be, it's good to be in, the, in the house of God. So Elizabeth was thankful. Anna was prayerful with Mary whom we're going to close with this, 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 this message with. Mary was a joyful woman. You know, eight times we get the word blessed associated with the Virgin Mary. And that word blessed means happy. It means joyful. Once it was announced to her, to Mary, that she had conceived and bare a son, here's what she says. My soul does magnify the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. You see, he was God, and he was a Savior. He was God, and he was man. He was man, and he was God. He was Emmanuel, God with us. Let me tell you now, as we come to a close this evening, or this day, let me tell you why Mary was a joyful mother. The first thing is this. She was chosen by God out of millions, millions, when God was looking for a vessel to carry his only son to a world. He sent Gabriel not to Hollywood. 
He didn't send Gabriel to New York or to the palaces of Rome, but he sent Gabriel, heaven came down to this little town of Nazareth. This town of Nazareth despised and destitute, a place of depression amongst the Judean hills. There was absolutely nothing there. You remember Nathaniel said to Jesus when he saw him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? It was a place you'd write it off. It's not even mentioned uh, hardly in any scriptures. People say to me, why did this, why did he choose Mary? I don't know. People say to me sometimes, why did he choose Jacob and not Esau? Or why did he choose G Judas? I don't know. I can't answer any of those questions, but I ask myself this. Why did he choose me? Why did he come to me? Why did he come to someone who blasphemed his preachers? Someone who hated the name of Jesus? Why did he come and bother about somebody like me away down in West Fermanagh? I don't know the answer to that. Why did he not come to others? I don't know the answer to that. But I know this, that in the, la in the, in the last day of May 1970, when Willie Spence led me to the Lord Jesus Christ, I can tell you then, he, he saved me that day and he called me that day. He didn't choose me that day. And I want to get this home to you. He didn't choose me this day. I was chosen and you were chosen. If you're a believer tonight, I was chosen and you were chosen away before time began. And that day that I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, I was saved. I was called out of darkness into the marvelous, glorious light of the gospel, into the kingdom of his dear Son. But I had been chosen away in eternity past. He chose Mary. He chose me. He chose every believer in Christ before the foundation of the world. Listen to Jeremiah 1. Before I formed thee, he said, in the belly, I knew thee before ye come out of your womb. I set you apart. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that powerful? Listen to Ephesians 1 and verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us, having selected us, having elected us and chosen us, that we should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. We sing sometimes before the hills in order stood, or earth received its frame. From everlasting to everlasting, he's evermore the same. Way back in eternity past, he saw me, he knew me. And Psalm 139 says, he knows our down sittings and our uprisings, and he knows our thought afar off. That's before the thought comes to you. God already knows it. That's the eternal God that knows all things. That's the reason we should praise him and we should thank him that we have a God that's an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, a mighty God, inscrutable, the God, Jehovah Yahweh, the God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob. When Paul the Apostle was stricken with conviction that saved on the Damascus Road, Here's what it says. He is, God says, He is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. Mary, Paul, me, every believer listening to me is saved and chosen and sanctified. Called, saved, chosen and sanctified. Hallelujah. And one day we're going to be glorified. Peter in 1st chapter 2 and verse 9 says, here's what Peter says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth praises of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. My friend, this doctrine of, 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 of election uh, baffles me and it humbles me and it breaks me at time to think of God choosing me and calling me and saving me when while millions and thousands around from Anna that I walked with and drank with and fought with and never seen any slight of the gospel in their lives. Many of them are gone. I can't understand that. But I know that God knows them that are his and God knows what is right. Hey, Mary, I tell you, Mary showed forth 
the praises of God in lip and in life. She showed forth the fact that Christ was formed in her, as we said last week. Everybody knew that Jesus, that, that there was a child in the womb. Everybody knew that Mary was different. Everybody knew that she was changed. There's so many people say today, oh, I'm saved and I'm born again, but there's not a bit of sign of life about them. Not a bit of sign of prayer. Not a bit of sign of praise. Not a bit of desire after God. Oh, it's so sad. My friend, you can't have Christ living in you and not know it and not show it and not be excited about it. I'm excited about it for 52 years and every day he gets sweeter as the days go by. Praise his name. And I can sing without a doubt I'm not ashamed to own my Lord or to defend his cause. But not only was she chosen and called to show forth praises, Listen to this as we come to an end. She was chosen to suffer, to suffer. Don't you think because you're saved or because you're blessed that you'll not suffer? It's the very opposite to it, I tell you. We're told in the Word of God to think it not strange if some fiery trial comes upon you. Don't think it's strange if you're entered into a trial, into an affliction, into a burden. Don't think it's strange that there's days you can't pray and days you can't read. Don't think it's strange when there's days a fear would come on you, doubt would come on you, and the devil would deny. Don't you think it's strange? Think it's strange if these things don't happen to you. Think it's strange if you're not in trial. Think it's strange if you're not in trouble. Because that's a sheer sign. Maybe some of you are listening to me just now and you're going through affliction and you're going through trials and troubles with cancers and different other things that nobody knows anything about and depression and oppression. I tell you, think that not strange. Don't let the devil tell you that you're not saved. I hear the accuser roar of things that I have done. I know them all and thousands more and Jehovah findeth none. Hallelujah. Don't let the devil tackle you about past sins. They're under the blood. They're in the sea of his forgetfulness. Never to be remembered again. No more forever. Praise God that he's a God who forgives and he's a God who forgets. Don't let the devil annoy you about the past. He's a liar and the, father, the devil. He's a liar and the father of lies. And God help us to realize that because we suffer and because we have trials and because we have affliction, don't you think for one moment that you're not saved? Just praise God that he has chosen you to suffer with him. And when you have Christ in your heart, you see so much today is going on in our evangelical circles. Nod your head and put up your hand and pray a wee sinner's prayer and all will be well. And oh, I tell you, it's a deception in many times. And it is not all well, my friend, if you don't repent of your sins, if you don't forsake them and, and flee from them and come to Christ and give him your heart and give him your life and give him your all. I tell you this, when the trials come and the problems come and the sickness comes, and the family trials come. You need an anchor to keep your soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. You need more than a wee prayer. You need Christ, and you need to know that you have him in your heart and in your life. People talk about the will of God. You know, I'm a long time on the road with God, 53 years. And I've been around many a corner, and people talk about the will of God. I always keep them to the three things that the Scripture says about the will of God. Everybody wants to know the will of God. And if you're saved today and you're a Christian today, God has something. He has a plan for your life. He has a gift for every one of us. Whatever your gift might be, you should find it out and utilize it for God. For the time is short and he needs you. Mother, he needs you. If ever he needed godly mother, the man at the Fermanagh graveyard was right. If ever he needs godly mothers, if ever we need godly mothers in Ireland, we need them tonight. The will of God. I keep people to the three essentials that the Bible says about the will of God. It's the will of God, first of all, that we should be saved. 
In 1 Timothy 1 and verse 4, Paul says, It is good and acceptable in the sight of God that all men and women would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, to know the truth. What is truth? What truth to know? Know that you're a sinner. Know that Christ died on yonder cross at Calvary for your sins. Know that he died and he was buried and he rose again and he lives in the power of an endless life. Know that he can cleanse away your sin. Know the truth that, the, that, that he can set you free forever. Know these truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, that is, is acceptable and good in the sight of God that all men would be saved. The second one is in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 3. That all, that all men and women would be sanctified. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. That's set apart. Don't get taken up with these big words. It's just set apart for God. When he saves a man or woman, he sets them apart for God. Sets them apart for his kingdom. Sets them apart for his church and for his people. Oh, what wonderful truth he says. But here's, here's the one we're at the, the night. Does the will of God, Peter says, that we would suffer for well-doing as believers. Do you hear that? It's the will of God that you might suffer. And Mary knew all about suffering. I tell you, that's why I chose her as my favorite woman in all the scriptures, because she bore, she bore pain and shame that no other woman ever bore. Like her own son, she went down into the deep where there was no standing and all the waves and the billows of God's wrath came over her. Every time they cursed him and mocked him and laughed at him and called him a devil, that sword pierced into the soul of that godly mother. You would know mother, what it might be like. I tell you, Mary was no Madonna with a halo over her head. Do you hear that now? She was a woman who knew all about suffering. And I pointed out that word twice that it says, blessed is she among women, not above women. Not above women. You know, I think it's four times in Matthew's gospel, the early part of Matthew's gospel that we read about the young child and Jesus, the, the young child and the mother, and the young child and the four times always come forth. Don't be putting Mary before him because she was a woman who needed to be saved because we read that. She says, God, my Savior, I tell you, they hated the Lord. That's what the Lord Jesus says. He says, they hated me without a cause. And they'll hate us, my friend, when we stand for truth and preach the truth. Mary came, and I'm coming to close now in a moment. Mary came to, to where every sinner needs to come. And that's to the foot of the cross. She was at the cross. And here's what it said about Mary at the cross. I want to say this to you. If he was the man of sorrows, she was the mother of sorrows. It says she stood by the cross. And I love that wee word stood. She didn't faint. She didn't run. She stood speaking and denoting of her faithfulness to him. She stood when crowds were mocking him. She stood when the thieves were taunting him. She stood when the priests were jeering him. She stood when all hell was clapping their hands, thinking that he was finished and all was over. What a woman she was. She stood when even, when even the Father had forsaken him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In those hours of darkness round the cross, Mary stood and not a word came from her. You know, I thank God tonight for an old grey-hearted mother who stood by me in days 
of wickedness and sin. Days when nobody else wanted me. Days when I hadn't a friend. Days when I'd come home cut and bruised and wounded in fights. Days when nobody else would put their arm around me. Days when I came home in rags. Oh, I thank God for a mother who cared for me. And if I would have known that, that psalm of David, does no man care for my soul on the streets of Manchester, I would have cried that out, does no man care for my soul. And I tell you, there's few cares out there for you, young man, tonight, if you're away from home. Don't forget your mother. What a mother, what a woman this was. Do you know the last time we read of Mary, the Virgin Mary, who bore Christ? Do you know the last time we read of her, she's in a prayer meeting. The first time we read of her, she's praising. And the last time we read about her, she's praying. After Jesus Christ died and was buried and ascended up to heaven, 120 of them gathered in the upper room. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, was there, it says, with the brethren. And I tell you, they were not praying to her. They were praying with her. Can I just close in a wee word to those of you who claim to be saved and Christians and born again and never in a prayer meeting. I can't understand that. You see all this woman suffered, all that she saw, all that she endured, that we will ever know anything about even, maybe not when we get to the glory. When this young 17-year-old was chosen of God to suffer and to bear and to carry the creator of the world that boggles your mind, I tell you, what a woman she was. And God knew what he was doing when he came down to Nazareth for Mary. He knew what he was doing. Let me say to you, you get into the prayer meeting. Young believer, get into the prayer meeting in a good evangelical church and believe God and see God working in your life. Let me give a word to those of you who still have your mother. Many of us have lost our mothers. Can I say to you, young man and young woman, from experience tonight, you look after her. Sit down and talk to her. Not only at Christmas or Mother's Day or her birthday. You know, there are a lot of lonely mothers out there. I was with a 90-year-old not so long ago and she says, they don't bother about me. I never see one from morning to night. One boy, she says, calls. But the rest of them, and all the grandchildren, never see one from morning to night, she said. I was with another woman and over 80 and how lonely she was. Can't drive. Sons and daughters hardly ever call to see her. God help us. You look after your mother boy because it's one of the commandments, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land. Mother, you'll not always have her and you look after her and do your best for her. Maybe, maybe, mother, you're in a nursing home. Maybe you're infirmed and the hills are hard to climb and you're weary along the journey and you've been through so much in life. Listen, God loves you. He's the God of all comfort. And what I would say to you, mother, tonight, if you're not saved, if you're not born again by the Spirit of God, if you've never repented of your sins and asked them into your heart, wherever you're sitting in that chair, in that nursing home, wherever you are tonight, pray a wee prayer and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Come into my heart and cleanse me from my sin. I repent of my sins and I turn to thee. My friend, when you can do nothing else, you can always pray. 
And thank God that he will forgive you and he'll cleanse you. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Thank him for Calvary. Thank him for the cross. Thank him for the blood that he shed. I thank him every day for the blood, of, for the blood that was shed. Peace, perfect peace in this world of sin. The blood of Jesus whispers peace within. God bless you, godly mother. God save you, mother, if you're not saved. And women listening to me, thank God. Thank God for all that you have and every blessing that you have. And may God bless you. And may you have a good and wonderful time in the days that lie ahead. For Jesus' sake, amen.